Well, it is good to see you, uh, or for you to see me, I should say. Uh, this is very, uh, a very strange day. I was so looking forward to being here in the dining room, speaking with you and spending some time with you. But here I am now in an empty dining room, and I'm looking at empty tables where you are supposed to be. And uh, this was the best place for us to do our recording. So I hope that you're safe at home. And in the coming days, that uh, as you watch this, that it, it will bring a, just some joy to your heart and uh, some challenge to your heart as we get to introduce the book of Psalms today. Let me pray, and uh, you can, I hope you'll be patient with me because, again, I am teaching to an empty room, which is a very strange experience for a teacher. I'm just having to imagine you as I am uh, teaching today. So let me pray, and uh, then we're going to do an introduction to the book of Psalms. Father, thank you that we have this time together, and we worship you, especially today, because of the book of Psalms and all that it represents. It is hard for us to imagine life without the book of Psalms. So thank you for the great blessing uh, that this is that you've given us uh, through writers like David and the sons of Korah and Asaph and even Moses a long time ago uh, writing the Psalms to comfort our hearts and to challenge us and to give us a big view of who you are. So I commit this time to you. You know the needs of each one that are listening and I know you care for them because the Psalms tell us that you are the, the shepherd uh, that cares for your flock. So again, I commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you a prayer request before I dig into the Psalms, and that is that Rose and I are leaving uh, tomorrow morning uh, for the Philippines, and hopefully all this bad weather is not going to mess with our flights the whole way across the world, and I will be doing ministry in the Philippines for the, about the next two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, and I'll be teaching at a seminary in Manila and doing a biblical counseling conference and also speaking at a local church. And uh, for our bodies at the age that they are, we don't like a 13-hour time change. So uh, Rose and I would really appreciate your prayer uh, for strength and endurance. Uh, and uh, it'll be perfect timing for you getting this and watching the video because we will already be on our way uh, to the Philippines, arriving about 10 p.m., uh, local time in the Philippines on Thursday, which I forget what time that will be this time. So please pray for us over the next 10 days. Something I'd like to ask you to do as we dig into the Psalms is uh, stretch your fingers because we are going to look at a bunch of Psalms right now over about the next 30 minutes. And so I need you to exercise your fingers, get your fingers all loosened up. And don't sit there and just watch this as if it's entertainment. Here's, if you have to press pause right now, please do it. And go get your Bible and get a notepad and a pen because this is an orientation to the book of Psalms. So I'm going to give you a lot of information right now. As I was thinking about how in the world do you introduce the book of Psalms in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, it's almost an impossibility. But I've put together an outline and my outline has three goals. One is to encourage you, the second is to orient you, and the third is to challenge you. Let me repeat that. I want to encourage you in the next 30 minutes or so. I want to orient you to the book of Psalms, and I would like to close then with challenging you. When I think of the book of Psalms, all kinds of words come to my mind, and I'm sure they come to your mind as well. And emotions come uh, to my mind describing what the book of Psalms is about. When I think of the book of Psalms, I think of the word majestic. Uh, when you read the book of Psalms, you are supposed to get a big, big, big view of who God is. And I'm thinking in particular of Psalm 145, which is one of my favorite Psalms. If we would have been in person, I was going to take a little bit of time and ask you, what are your favorite psalms and why? But listen to Psalm 145. It's a majestic view of God. 
I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Listen to this because it gives us a worldview verse. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. In other words, worship is not just for Sunday. Worship is every day. So when you read Psalms, you're supposed to get a majestic view of God. You're supposed to think of the God who's the creator. You look at the stars and you're humbled like David in Psalm 8. He goes on to say in Psalm 145, and this is a Davidic psalm as well, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. When I think of words that describe the Psalms, I think of majestic. Uh, I also think of the word humbling, and I already talked about Psalm 8, where David is looking at the heavens, and he says, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And when I consider the stars and the sum of them, what is man that you are mindful of him? So David, as an inspired writer, who, as you know, his background was a shepherd, I can picture him laying out uh, under the stars, looking up at the stars at night, and just contemplating God and how big he is, and he's worshiping God, and he's very humbled. I've had that experience myself, and maybe you have as well as you've looked up at the stars. I also think of another word describing the Psalms, and that is comforting. Why do we love the Psalms? Well, the Psalms are so realistic, and they comfort us in the midst of our distress. And of course, the Psalm that comes to mind is Psalm 23. I'm sure it's a favorite of many of you. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. Uh, just that beautiful psalm about uh, who the Lord is, and it brings such comfort to our hearts. And there's so many other themes in the book of Psalms that bring us comfort, uh, including who God is, the future hope of our Messiah, uh, etc. I think of emotions when I think of other words that describe the Psalms. Emotions. Look at Psalm 28. So if you haven't gotten your Bible yet, please Press pause, go get your Bible, and I need you to do your finger exercises and get all loosened up because we're going to keep looking at different psalms. Listen to Psalm 28. This is such an emotional psalm. Many psalms I could have picked that are emotional, but this is the one that came to mind because the Lord used Psalm 28 in my life uh, many years ago to comfort me and to challenge me, but it's such an emotional psalm. David says, Lord, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to die. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I'm going to die. I will become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Another word that comes to mind comes out of this psalm, and that is that the psalms are realistic. Uh, why do we love the psalms? Well, they just picture human life. Uh, this psalm, like many psalms, pictures betrayal by other humans. Have you ever had someone betray you? I'm sure you have. Uh, you have lived life long enough that you have had broken relationships. You've had people that have hurt you deeply. And uh, David has been betrayed, and it's being pictured in this psalm that he was betrayed. I did an interesting study one time of the book of Psalms, and especially the Davidic Psalms, and what I looked at was how many times uh, David in his Psalms talked about being betrayed by others or having problems with people. David wrote just about half the Psalms. Uh, most scholars say 72. There are some Psalms that uh, sound very much like a Davidic psalm, but it doesn't have up at the top uh, a psalm of David. So there are a few psalms that we, we think are Davidic psalms that aren't exactly attributed uh, to him. But there are 72 that are clearly Davidic psalms. And I counted up how, in how many of those psalms David was having people problems. It was two-thirds of the Davidic psalms. Well, no wonder we relate well to the Psalms, because that's our human experience. The Psalms are about reality. 
The Psalms picture rejoicing and happiness. The Psalms talk about children. The Psalms talk about death. The Psalms talk about rejoicing and worshiping. Uh, emotions like anxiety, guilt, shame, fear are all talked about in the Psalms. Uh, they are about real life, and maybe that's why we love them so much. Uh, there's enemies, there's death, there's vengeance, there's, there's struggles with sleep. Do any of you struggle with sleep? Uh, I know I do from time to time. Well, the Psalms talk about the psalmist talk, uh, struggling with sleep, and if you're interested in that, look at Psalm 42, because Psalm 42 talks about the sons of Korah and the, the writer of that psalm struggling with sleep, and how God ministers to that psalmist in the night. The psalms, other words that uh, come to my mind when it comes to the psalms. Uh, the psalms are hope-filled. Do you need hope in the days that we're living in? Many, many, many people need hope for the days that we're living in. Well, what? where's the hope in the psalms? Well, in the psalms, there is a future. It's not like in the psalms we're picturing Struggles here on life, and then you die, and then that's it. The Psalms picture there is a God. He is the majestic God of the universe. He's in control. He is sovereign, and there is a future. And we are admonished over and over in the Psalms to put our hope in him. There is a future. There is a God. He is merciful. And the most important part of the Psalms that give hope and I'm going to talk about this as a whole separate category, is there is a coming Messiah. In the Psalms, there are a number of Psalms that are what we call Messianic Psalms, and these are all over the place in the Psalms that, remember, these were written before the time of Christ, and so they're looking forward to the coming Messiah, and they're look, they needed hope. Uh, they were going through things like captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and they needed to cling to something. You need something to cling to right now as we think about our country, we think about the world. You need things to cling to. Well, guess what? The Messiah is coming again. Uh, the book of Psalms talks about the coming Messiah, so there is hope. Let me uh, orient you a little bit more to the book of Psalms. And the first thing I want to talk to you about, I'm going to talk to you about a number of things just to kind of give you a a general overview of the Psalms, and one of those things is the structure of the Psalms. Turn in the, uh, your Psalm, uh, book of Psalms, to Psalm 41, and I'd like you to notice something between Psalm 41 and 42, and for the sake of time, I won't go into all the details of this, but the book of Psalms are divided into five books. Many people don't realize this, but Throughout history, and this is ancient, there are indications even in the book of Chronicles that they were using some of these breakdowns of the book of Psalms uh, thousands of years ago, even when the book of Chronicles was written. So be between Psalm 41 and 42, I'm going to read the last verse of Psalm 41, and then I'd like you to look at the beginning of Psalm 42. And your Bible probably says something. Psalm 41, 13, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. Now notice what is before Psalm 42. Your Bible probably says book two. That is not just your translation and modern translators inserting that in the book of Psalms. That is ancient. Uh, that has been there for uh, a long, long time, uh, long before our English translations. There are five divisions. Here they are. Psalm 1 through 41, Psalms 42 to 72, Psalms 73 to 89, Psalms 90 through uh, 106, and then Psalm 107 to the end. Those are the five books of the Psalms. And you can even go into more detail, and there's groupings within those Psalms of who are the main authors, etc. You probably realize that the book of Psalms are poems that are hymns. This is Hebrew poetry that is sung. I find it interesting that there are still some churches today that they don't sing modern hymns. All they use is what's called the Psalter. They sing the Psalms. 
These were meant to be sung. And you see at the beginning, at the top of many of these uh, psalms, uh, musical notations. And since we're at Psalm 41 and 42, your Bible may already be open there. It says at Psalm 42, to the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah. A mascal is probably a musical term. And you can see the musical notation there, to the choir master, a mascal. There's a number of musical terms uh, throughout the Psalms because these are poems that were originally meant to be sung. Let's talk about Hebrew poetry a little bit. And uh, let me orient you to what Hebrew poetry is like because it's not like our poetry. There's all kinds of different uh, poems. So when you think of uh, English poems, you think about things that rhyme. Well, in Hebrew poetry, there is some rhythm to it, and I'm going to show you an example of this. But there's different types of Hebrew poetry, and the main type is called parallelism. Let me show you an example of this. Look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Here's an example of parallelism. Psalm 103, verse 10. There's all kinds of different types of parallelism as well. I'll show you an example of what's called antithetical parallelism here in a moment. But Psalm 103 verse 10 says this. Notice how the first line says something and then the second line restates it. This is called parallelism. Psalm 103 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Now the psalmist says the same thing but with different words in the second line. He just adds to it nor repay us according to our iniquities. Do you see the parallelism? Sins and iniquities. The first line is stating something. The second line is repeating it. Uh, that reminds me, seeing these words, sins and iniquities, here's a theme you can be looking for in the book of Psalms. Uh, there are words like sin, iniquity, and transgression. Those three words for sin gets you, get used over and over in the book of Psalms. Now, let me show you an example of antithetical parallelism. Go back toward the front again and look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Here's antithetical parallelism, 37.21. The wicked borrows but does not pay back. Now, here's the opposite. He's made a statement, but now he's making the opposite statement. Antithetical parallelism. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. And if you are a student of the Bible, which I hope all of you are, you probably pick up, how that, pick up on how that sounds like a proverb as well. Many proverbs as Hebrew poetry have this same type of structure. It's called antithetical parallelism. There is some rhythm to Hebrew poetry. It's not mainly rhythmic like ours where we have words that rhyme in English poetry but listen to the rhythm of Psalm 26 2 and the Hebrew if you're looking at this in Hebrew you could even pick up the rhyme in the Hebrew or the rhythm not the rhyme the rhythm in the Hebrew listen to it in Psalm 26 2 it even comes out in our English translation translation so I'm going to read it the way it is exactly translated, and then I'm going to show you the rhythm. Psalm 26.2 says, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Now here's parallelism, the second line. Test my heart and my mind. Let me read it again. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. Now listen for the rhythm. Prove, O Lord, and try. Test my heart and mind. Do you hear the rhythm with it? Uh, that's how it's, you're supposed to read this in Hebrew. So there is some rhythm with Hebrew poetry. And then uh, there's a couple of other kinds, but I think uh, I'm going to just tell you what they are so that I can uh, get on because the clock is ticking away very quickly. There is climatic parallelism where one line says something and then the next line, and sometimes it's even three lines. It just keeps building and building and building. Uh, an example of this might be, O oh Lord, you're against the wicked. O oh Lord, you will destroy the wicked. O oh Lord, the wicked will be utterly banished from the earth. 
and it just gets climatic as it goes throughout. And that's all in one verse. That's called climatic parallelism. Uh, let me show you this one because this is a famous type of poetry, Psalm 109. And it raises all kinds of questions. This is called imprecatory psalms. Maybe you've been tempted to pray an imprecatory psalm on someone. An imprecatory psalm is a psalm of curse against another person. Uh, these people were going through many, many trials, especially during the Babylonian captivity. And Psalm 109.12 says this, Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. That is a harsh psalm. Now, I have not been very tempted very often to pray imprecatory psalms, but I can tell you in recent years as I've dealt with domestic abuse cases in the counseling center, there are some men that I have been very, very tempted to pray imprecatory psalms against. And uh, really what these are is cries for justice as these people are wanting, needing, wanting justice from the Lord. The most important of the types of psalms, as we're thinking about structure, are messianic psalms. And I'm going to, for the sake of time, wish I could show you more. But look at Psalm 22. This is a famous psalm, a messianic psalm. The word messianic is related to our Lord. We call our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ means Messiah. So messianic psalms are psalms before he came that are predicting who he was and who he was going to be. Now, I know you can't see him, but I'm going to say hi to Chef Greg right now. And uh, aren't we missing the senior adults today? We just wish they were here today. He said he's missing you, and he has fried chicken ready for you. <laughs> Amen, Amen, he says. Psalm 22, and let me tell you about Psalm 22. This is a very special psalm. It is quoted eight times in the New Testament, four times in, in Matthew 27, three times in John 19, and then Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. That's how many times Psalm 22 is quoted. Here's what you need to realize when you look at Psalm 22, and you recognize it as things that the Lord said on the cross as he's hanging on the cross. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Uh, as you read down through this psalm, you picture a number of things of the Lord hanging on the cross. And what I came to realize a number of years ago, as you hear the seven last words of the Lord from the cross, as he's hanging on the cross, you see those paralleled, many of them here in Psalm 22. Well, what that made me realize then a number of years ago is the Lord must have been praying and meditating on Psalm 22 as he's hanging on the cross. So you're seeing some of it come out of his mouth actually as he's hanging on the cross, but some of the in-between lines are here in Psalm 22, and that's probably what the Lord was praying and thinking on as he was hanging on the cross for our, our sins. Uh, psalm 118 is a beautiful messianic psalm. There are uh, very, in the New Testament, the New Testament makes clear there are at least 14 clear messianic psalms in the Old Testament. Another type of psalm is doxologies. And what are the doxologies? They're just praise to God, like Psalm 145 and a number of other of psalms. Why are those psalms good for us, those psalms of doxology, as we continue to think about poetry and structure of the book of Psalms? These are good for us because it is easy for us, as you, if you listen to the news, you look at what's going on in the world, you look at what's going on in the United States, it is easy, and you look at what's going on in your life, it is easy to get focused on the here and now, and your life, and your problems. Well, what do the doxologies do? The psalms of praise about God make you lift up your eyes and get your eyes off the present and all of your problems and get your gaze upward to who God is 
it gets your mind occupied instead of with all your problems, how am I going to pay my bills and what's happening to my children and what's going to happen to my grandchildren and what's happening in the world. Instead of thinking on all those things, you think in praise things like God is the rock, God is the refuge, God is the eternal, God is the almighty. Uh, Psalms of praise, the doxologies, are really good for us because they get our mind off the present and they help us do what we were actually created to do, and that is to be worshipers of the true and living God. I've oriented you to the Psalms. I've been trying to encourage you with the Psalms. Let me continue with some encouragement. And then for a couple of minutes, I want to finish with a challenge. So here's some more encouragement. How do the Psalms picture God? What is his character? Well, he is the sovereign. He is sitting over all the earth. In fact, Psalm 2, look at Psalm 2. This is a delightful Psalm. Psalm 2 is talking about the nations, and I haven't talked about Psalm 1 much. Let me just make a quick comment about Psalm 1. Many commentators think that Psalm 1 is an orientation to the whole book, that Psalm 1 is picturing who are you going to follow. Are you going to be the man or woman who delights in the law of God and meditates in his law day and night? Or are you going to be like the wicked who get blown away like the chaff? And that's the contrast in Psalms. Who or what are you going to serve? And that's going to be part of my challenge at the end, is who or what are you going to serve? And it starts right off in the Psalms of, who are you going to serve? What, what are you going to live for in this life? Well, Psalm 2 then builds on that with there is a God and he is in control. And listen to verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. There's a hint about the coming Messiah. He goes on to talk about how God is in the heavens, he's over all, and he laughs at the nations. So all the chaos that's going on in the world right now, God is in heaven and he's in control. He's not wringing his hands in despair. And verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And then verse 6 says, as for me, I've set my king on Zion my holy hill. And he goes on to talk about his son, his begotten son, who is the Messiah of the world. And so you get hints of the Trinity. So who is the God of the, Bible, of the Psalms? He is sovereign. Many Psalms talk about him as the creator. Then here's a special word you ought to look for in the Psalms, uh, depending on what translation you have. He is the God of loving kindness or the God of steadfast love. It is worth all your time that you invest in this to study the theme in the Old Testament of God's steadfast love, his character of being a God of loving uh, kindness. The Hebrew word is kesed, and it is God's commitment to his people many times in spite of who we are. He is a God of loving kindness. The Hebrew word is so rich that the English translators could not find one word to translate it properly, so they put together two English words, loving kindness, and they make up a word to capture the meaning of this one Hebrew word of God's kesed, his steadfast love. We also see in the Psalms, who is God? He is a God of justice. Uh, all things will be made right. Nobody's going to get away with anything. God is a God of justice. He is the immutable God. He's the unchangeable God. He is the God who cares intimately about his people like a shepherd with his sheep. He is the God who saves. He is a God who makes promises. He is the almighty God. And many, many, many more things in the book of Psalms about who our God is. Now let me finish with a challenge. And I'd like you to turn to Psalm 18. Psalm 18 and one of the things that the Psalms challenge us with is who or what is God in your life? And if you've been around me uh, very much, you know that I talk about uh, idolatry of the heart. Of what's going on on the inside of us as humans? Well, Psalm 18 says this. 
I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my refuge, or my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies. Let me make one more comment about structure before I continue with my challenge. If you look up at the very beginning, there's a long section right before verse 1 in small print. This is called the superscription, and that is actually part of the Hebrew text. That, in uh, some languages, like Russian Bibles, that's verse 1 in the Russian Bible. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, that is verse 1. Uh, we start with verse 1 with, I love you, O Lord, my strength. But that small print, the superscription, is actually part of the inspired Word of God. That's not something that your English translators have added into the text. David is under tremendous pressure. Maybe you're feeling tremendous pressure uh, today. David's under tremendous pressure. Uh, he says in verse 4, the cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me. He's under tremendous pressure to the point that he thinks he's going to die. And the question he's raising is, under pressure, what will you turn to as your rock, your fortress, and your refuge? Uh, as you know, I do counseling, and uh, I uh, have found over and over in the counseling room that the reason why people are in the counseling room often is that they have made other things their rocks, their refuges, and their fortresses. Um, it's very easy for alcohol to become a refuge that people run to. But that's probably not a big struggle for most of you listening. Uh, but we can run to entertainment, and we can hide in entertainment and make entertainment our refuge rather than running to the Lord. Uh, there are so many things that are temptations for us as humans to make them our rocks. Like when you think of a rock, you think of stability. And uh, what do we count on as humans for stability? For many people, it would be their bank account. And I would feel more secure if I had more money in my bank account. But then you get more money in your bank account and you still don't feel secure. So what's the answer? The answer is to learn to run to the Lord as your rock and your refuge so that even if you don't have the money, you still have the Lord as your rock and your refuge. Nothing wrong with watching a movie and watching some entertainment, but if that's the main way you escape to deal with the pressures of life, what happens to your prayer life? Why not turn to the Lord as your rock and your refuge? There's a number of things in the Psalms that we get challenged with. Uh, Psalm 52 challenges us not to make money our refuge. Psalm 146 challenges us not to make another human being our refuge. And that psalm's really important because we're in a presidential election year, and I'm dreading it just like you are probably. And uh, we know that things are just going to heat up as this year goes on and on, and I'm actually dreading it and already praying about it and praying that the, the Lord would be merciful to us as we go through this uh, nasty political year. But Psalm 146 warns us about putting our hope in princes and reminding us that the very day that that prince dies, his plans perish. Our hope for America is not in a president. Our hope for America is revival and turning to the Lord. Uh, the Psalms challenge us with many things. Let me give you one last challenge. So that's the challenge of idolatry. And now, Psalm 28, verse 6 says this. We already looked at Psalm 28 earlier. I want to finish with this challenge, Psalm 28, 6. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. We looked at Psalm 28 earlier where David was being attacked by people. And he cries out to God, if you don't save me, I'm going to die. Well, God has heard him and rescued him. Now, verse 7 is really important. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. And my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Uh, one of the themes that comes up over and over in the Psalms is what am I trusting in? 
And have I learned how to trust the Lord? What is trust? Uh, trust comes up over, hope, trust, wait, rest. All those themes come up over and over in the book of Psalms. And the word trust means to actively, vigorously choose to believe the promises of this book in spite of the circumstances that are going on around you. Now, if you choose to do that, that means you're fighting with your soul. I have to fight with my soul. I've got to fight with my mind. I've got to fight with my inner person. But if I choose to do that, and I choose to believe what, this word, what the Word of God says, the promises of the Word, in spite of what my mind is telling me and in spite of what circumstances are telling me, you know what happens often? My soul becomes more at rest. I have more peace because I'm wrestling with my inner person to believe what God's Word says. A famous preacher named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. He was a physician, and then he became a pastor in England, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. The problem with most Christians is that they are believing what their self says rather than telling themselves what to believe. Let me say it again. The problem with most Christians is that they are believing what their self says rather than telling themselves what to believe. The book of Psalms urges us to trust in God. Trust is a vigorous practice of believing the promises in spite of what your person is telling you and in spite what the circumstances of life are telling you. Well, that's a really quick orientation to the book of Psalms, and I hope you enjoy next week as uh, Pastor Heath digs into, I think, Psalm 1. Again, I'm sorry that I couldn't see you in person. I always enjoy time with you, and I hope uh, that in the coming months I will get to come and hang out with you during a lunchtime sometime. Let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you uh, for this time to orient uh, our senior adults to the book of Psalms, and I thank you that over the coming months they're going to hear from a number of their pastors about the book of Psalms. Help it to be encouraging. Help it to be challenging. Uh, we need that, Lord, in the days we're living in. Thank you for your character and how you're portrayed in the book of Psalms, and especially thank you for the messianic hope that we have in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.